Welcome to the Askeville Assembly of God Sermon Podcast. We're so glad you've taken the time to listen, and we pray this message from our pastors will be a blessing on your life this week. Uh, thank you again for your prayers. Uh, when when uh, I resigned the church and, and I was uh, really contemplating, I said, Lord, what do you want me to preach in the English-speaking churches, the Russian-speaking churches? What do you want me to preach? I mean, I've got a lot of sermons in my office. So what, where do I focus on? What do I focus on? And the Lord began to lay on my heart uh, the subject of the Holy Spirit. Now, I believe that all of us here realize and recognize America has some major issues in it. huh? Can you say amen? We've got major problems. But can I let you know, if you don't know already, that the answer to America's problems is not in a political party. But the answer to America's problems lies within the church. And it's not just any church. It's a spirit-filled church that's got the power of God flowing through it. You see, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says, You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you, and we need the power of God flowing in our lives if we're going to reach our community, if we're going to see souls saved, if we're going to see America changed, it's going to take the power of God to do it, not a political party. So I began to think about our our messages on the Holy Spirit, and the Lord has directed me this morning to go to 2 Kings chapter number 4, verses 1 to 7. If we could, let's uh, go there. It should be on the screen, and let's uh, read this. 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, well, your servant, your your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he he said, go borrow vessels from uh, everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went uh, from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her sons, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there's not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God, And he said, go sell the oil, pay your debt, and you and your sons live on the rest. If I could title my message this morning, it's bring me another vessel. Now, anybody here ever been healed by the power of God? Let me see your hands. Come on. Everybody here should have your hands. Everybody here ever been blessed financially? Let me see your hands. Yeah, everybody. How many of you here saved this morning? Let me see. All right, good. I got all the hands that time. Most of any. Uh, well, the, the fact is that God never does anything without a purpose. He healed you for a reason. He healed you not so you could just go about living your everyday life like you'd always done, but he healed you so you could share your testimony of what God has done in your life with someone else that needs a healing. And what happens is their faith is increased and they can get a healing. He has blessed you financially so you could bless someone else that's in need. He saved you so you could share this good news, the hope that he has given to you with someone else that has no hope. So everything God has done for you, he has done it for a reason and for a purpose. Everything that he says is for a reason and for a purpose. Therefore, everything that's written in the word of God is for a reason and for a purpose. Now, the Old Testament is no different. Some people I enjoyed your messages on the Word of God. Last week we were able to slip in and had a cancellation able to slip in and heard a wonderful message on the Word of God from your pastor. But the Word of God, the Old Testament, is important because much of the Old Testament, if not all of it, is pointing to something that's getting ready to happen in the New Testament. So when you read the Old Testament, you can see symbols or messages that's pointing to something to come. Let me give you a few examples of this. The the lamb caught in the thicket when Abraham was offering his son Isaac, well, it was symbolic of Jesus, the lamb in the New Testament that was taking our place as a sacrifice. In Moses speaking 
to the rock uh, in the wilderness uh, or striking the rock it symbolized Jesus of the New Testament. You can read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. But that was the great sin of Moses. You see, Moses struck the rock twice. He disobeyed the Lord, but he struck the rock twice, and Jesus would only be crucified one time. The next time, now, we talk to him. We speak to him. But this was the great sin of Moses. Jesus was the rock. Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. It was used as a symbol of Christ being lifted up. Uh, John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And then throughout the Bible, both Old and New Testament, water and oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So with this thought in mind, and knowing that God never does anything without a purpose, I believe we see a crucial and important message in this story that I just read to you from uh, 2 Kings. It was not just a message that sustained life for this woman and her children, but, uh, but a message that I believe sustains life for you and I today. You see, God is looking for vessels and you and I are the vessels. Can you just point to yourself and say, I am a vessel. I am a vessel. God is looking for me. He's looking for a vessel that he can flow through. You see, without a human vessel, God cannot operate. He cannot work. You see, God, in the very beginning, he said, let there be, and there was. He could do that again. He could say, let there be, and there could be. But now he's chosen to use people to work through, people like the Boswells to work through, people like you uh, to work through in your community, on your jobs. He's used people now, so you and I are the vessels that he is looking for. So in this passage that we read, these vessels were life to this woman and her sons. The more vessels, the more life. And I say to you this morning, we are the life to our community. The life to our community is not at the ballparks. The life to our community is not in Hollywood, but the life in our community is the God-fearing, spirit-filled people uh, that, that lives uh, wholly and truly for him. That is the life for our community. And so, friends, I encourage you today that we are to be that vessel that God can flow through. Now, since you and I are the vessels, I want to look this morning uh, at three things that the vessel must be. Three things that the vessel must be. If we're going to be that vessel that the Lord can flow through, we've got to look at these three things. First of all, we've got to look at being available. The first thing the vessel must be is the vessel must be available. Now, this woman only had one vessel with a little teeny bit of oil, uh, but I'm sure she was appreciative of that. But she knew that this wouldn't be enough to sustain her. That's why she cried out to the prophet. She needed more. Can I ask you this morning, how many of you will recognize you need more than what you got today? I'm 64 years old. I've been raised in the church all my life, but I can tell you, my friends, I need more today than I had yesterday. And I don't care how long you've been in the church, how long you've been saved, you need more today than you had yesterday. And this woman recognized that. She needed more, but she had to find some, some available vessels. Unfortunately, so many people in our culture are not available for God. You see, we look, uh, we look on um, on Sundays, and those of you that like football, and I know football season's about to, about to wind up, but you can go on any given Sunday during the season, and all over this country, the stadiums are full of people. Now, I'm not saying all those people are not Christians. There is, I'm sure there's some of those people that love the Lord and are saved, but I can say this, uh, that on a Sunday, there's all those people are not available for church. You say, well, they might have gone to the early service. That's true. They could have gone to the early service. Uh, they could be there, but the truth of the matter is uh, there's a lot of those people that are not available for God. I was riding down the Columbia River that separates Washington and Oregon not long ago. I was headed to a church in, in uh, Vancouver, Washington, and I looked out, and it's salmon fishing season. The salmon are running. The river was full of boats. Uh, when I got to church, there was some people there, but I got to thinking about this. Uh, I got to thinking there was a lot of people out there on the river that are not available for God. 
God. Friends, we have a world full of people that are not available. They're too busy for God. But we can't really accuse them as much uh, but sometimes because oftentimes we have people in the church uh, that are not available. They'll come sit in the back seat or front seat or wherever seat you want to sit, but they'll sing the songs. Uh, they might raise their hands. They might worship the Lord a little bit. But pastor, don't ask me to do anything. Uh, I'm not available. I'm too busy. I've got to work. I've got work. I've got my own family. Lord, don't tell me to go to Alaska. Don't tell me to do this. Friends, I'm telling you this morning, if we're going to be a vessel that is uh, used of God, we've got to be available to say, Lord, I'll go anywhere. I'll say anything. I'll do anything you want me to do. And that's the one he will use and flow through. We've got to be available for him. You say, well, I'm not qualified. God's not looking for ability but availability. People are dying and going to hell because we're too busy. We're not available. I'm sure all of you have got one of these, a cell phone. And you've had times when you've dialed someone and it went beep, 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 beep. What does that mean? It means they're busy. Maybe you got an answer, an answering machine. And you said, I'm sorry, I'm not available right now. Please leave a message and I'll call you back. Lying answer machine. They don't call you back. Well, I'm a, I think that sometimes that's what we do with God. God's trying to call us, and we're saying, beep, 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 Lord, I'm not available right now. Maybe when I get through uh, with fulfilling my dreams or my goals or when my kids are raised, uh, I'll be more available for you. I'm saying to you this morning, friends, uh, if we're going to be used of God and be the life to our community, we've got to be available now for him for whatever he wants for us to do. So, availability. We've got to be available. The, this, the second thing the vessel must be, the, the vessel must be clean. The vessel must be clean. Now, this woman sent her sons looking for, vessel, for vessels to bar vessels. Now, can't you picture this? Here we go. He goes to the neighbor's house. Yes, the, neighbor, the lady says, yes, could I help you? Mom wants to borrow some vessels. You got any vessels? And she says, well, I, I might have, uh, let's see, I might have one down in the basement. Let me go down and look. She goes down in the basement. She pulls out this vessel. It's, she hadn't used it in a while. <laughs> she blows in it. The dust flies out. Might have some spider webs in it. Could even have a spider or two. Now, she's going to clean that vessel before she loans it out. You say, well, that's not written in the Bible. And you're exactly right. It's not in there. But I don't know a woman here that's not going to clean her vessel before she loans it out. In fact, I believe that she cleaned the vessel, and when Mama got it over here, Mama cleaned it again. My opinion is the vessel got cleaned twice, and I believe that that shows a thorough cleansing, and you and I, if we're going to be used of God, we've got to be cleansed by the power of His Spirit. You say, clean of what? Well, clean of dirt or the sins that are hidden inside of us. You see, my friends, we can come to church. We can put on a show or put on a face. We can smile. We can fool the pastor, fool the Sunday school teachers. We can fool everybody around us. But God knows if you've got anger in your heart. He knows if you've got bitter in your heart. He knows if you've got unforgiveness in your heart. He knows if there's hidden sins that you have, and you must confess those sins if you want to be used of God. So we've got to be cleansed of all those hidden things and hidden sins in our life. We've got to be cleansed of the self-help attitude that we have that has crept within the church, within our culture. You see, uh, when I was growing up, y'all know my dad. My dad was a carpenter, a bricklayer by trade, but dad never taught me how to do it. I was the gopher. I had to go get the brick, go get the mortar, do that. He never taught me how to lay brick and how to, to you do carpentry work. So when Trey was growing up, uh, I didn't teach Trey how to do it. And so when Trey now has his own family, uh, he, uh, in order to save money, he's gone to something called YouTube and figured out how to do it himself. And so he can build his 
Uh, he built a nice little deck on the back of his house himself. He has uh, uh, repaired things in his house. He's done it himself. And those are really nice things to do. You know, it's nice to be able to do things like that yourself and save a little money. But that mentality sometimes has crept within the church where we feel like we know how to have church. We know the songs to sing that will move people. We know how to, how to to the words to say, and we learn how to do it ourselves. My friends, we can do absolutely nothing ourselves. We cannot have the church without having the spirit of the presence of God in this place. You see, I, I play the piano a little bit. I sing a little bit. I've gone to college and learned how to put together a three-point sermon and everything, but I want you to understand, I don't want to get on those keyboards without having the anointing of God on my life. I don't want to get up here and sing without having the anointing of God on my life. I don't want to preach without having the anointing of God on my life. I've seen too many people tear the keyboard all to pieces and get up and bow and everybody give their a big hand clap of praise. I've seen the people get up and sing, a man sing like a woman and a woman sing like a man and everybody said, whoa, they got talent and they give a big hand clap of praise. We've seen that. But my friends, we don't need to do anything within the house of God that the presence of God isn't flowing through us. We've got to have God's presence, his spirit working in our lives. See, Abraham tried to help God out with a descendant and Ishmael was born and there was trouble ever since. Moses tried to help God out to deliver Israel, killed the Egyptian, fled to the wilderness. Forty years later, the Lord came back to him and knocked on his door and said, Hey, uh, Moses, I haven't forgotten where you are. I still want to use you. And Moses said, oh, no, 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 God, I can't do it. I can't do it. And God says, now I can use him. I can use him because he thinks he can't. And can I say this to you, my friends, this morning? If you feel like you cannot be used of God, you are a great candidate for God doing miracles through your life. If you will just let him. You're a great candidate. We have to be emptied of the old water or old oil and get some fresh. <laughs> you know, I've been told that oil, if you leave it there long enough, it gets stinky. And I'm afraid in a lot of Pentecostal churches around our country today, there's people that have gotten the Holy Ghost years ago, but they don't have a fresh touch and they stink. We need a fresh touch, a fresh oil, a fresh flowing of the Holy Ghost in our life today, uh, my friends. Listen, we need to be emptied of the old and get some fresh. Sometimes trials come into our lives in order to empty us of our sin of self-help or, or attitudes that we have. Other times trials or temptations may come to get us ready for something bigger or better. And I think that one of the great stories of the Bible, Joseph, is an example of this. How many of you like the, the story of Joseph? Joseph, it's a really cool story. His life was like a roller coaster. Anybody like roller coasters here? Come on, let me see. Roller coaster people. I got a few roller coasters. I hate roller coasters. I don't like them. I, just not too long ago, Sheree, maybe about six months ago, Sheree found out I didn't like roller coasters. She said, Dad, I thought you loved roller coasters. You always went with us. I said, I just did it for y'all. You know, we do stupid stuff for our children. You know? And I said, I said, no, I just did it for y'all. You know why I don't like roller coasters? Two reasons. Number one, number one, you get to the top of that thing and it goes boom. And when it falls, your stomach's left up there and your body's down there and it makes you really feel uh, yucky. You know what I'm saying? And the second thing is the Bible says, lo, I am with you always, and I'm way up there. And when it goes down there, I get scared to death. So why pay good money to get sick and get scared? Doesn't make sense, does it? <laughs> so I hate roller coasters. But sometimes life is like a roller coaster. You ever had life, you know, one day you're up here. Woo, things are going good. The next day you're down in the valley. Or maybe it's the one week you're up here, the next week you're in the valley. It might be some news you had or some things that happened at work or whatever, but life is like a roller coaster. You're up here, you're down here. You're up here, you're down here. Well, Joseph's life was like a roller coaster. You see, he was a dad's best kid. Now, just a little bit of advice for you young people that are here. You're going to have multiple kids. You got you have to love them all the same. You can't have one you can't love one over the other. You got to love them all the same. Now, 
Well, Pastor Webb, you got to love them all the same now, okay? I preached at a, I preached at a Russian church uh, back in Vancouver in September, and the pastor had 17 children. He was 50 years old, one wife, and had 17. And I told him, you got to love them all the same. I'd get them confused. Which one are you? I forget which. I wouldn't know which one was which. <laughs> but Joseph, he was number 11. He was number 11 out of 12. And Dad really loved him best. Dad bought him a nice, colorful, colorful uh, jacket. He'd walk around. Kind of reminds me. I know it wasn't Hunter's Orange, but it would remind me of Hunter's Orange in the sense that it stood out. You know, he had this jacket. He'd walk around proud. Look at me. Dad loves me best. <laughs> Dad loves me best. He was on cloud nine, 17 years old, loved the best and all that. But his brother sold him into Egypt. All of a sudden, the bottom fell out. And now he is gone from family. But then he gets a good job at Potiphar's house, and he's back on top again. But then he's accused of rape, and now the bottom falls out again. He's put in prison. But then finally, he's put in second command of Pharaoh, and he's back on top. His life was like a roller coaster. But all the time, God was getting him ready to preserve his people. And can I say to you this morning, friends, your life might be like a roller coaster. You may be up today and down tomorrow, but if you will hold the course and stay the course and continue to trust in God, God is preparing you to deliver your community, your family, and I believe your nation. But you've got to stay the course, even though it might be difficult. So, John the Baptist, he must increase, but I must decrease. We got to be cleansed. We got to be purified. God's tomorrow of wonders awaits our today of sanctification. I heard someone just say recently, "The oil cannot flow where the blood has it cleansed." And so, friends, we've got to. If there's things in our life, we've got to ask the Lord to forgive us. But let's look at the third and final thing: the vessel must be number three. The vessel must be full. The vessel must be full. Now, I don't believe that this woman, when she started filling the vessels, I don't believe she filled it half full. I don't believe she filled it three quarters full. I believe she filled it so full that it was running over. That's what I would do, you know. I mean, that's why I believe, that, you know, the Bible. But she filled it so full that it was running over the sides. Can I say this to you this morning, friends? That's what the Lord wants to do with you and I is to fill us so full that we're running over the sides that people around us are being blessed. You don't even have to say a word when you walk by someone. You go by someone in the grocery store and just walk by them. You're so full of the Holy Ghost that, that you walk by someone and they say, whoa, there's something I feel about that person there. You can be pumping gas on one side of the gas pump and somebody look around, they feel the presence of God in your life. I'm saying that is possible because it was possible for the early church. Peter, when he walked down the road, they put people, the sick, in his shadows so they would be healed. I believe you and I can be so full of the Holy Ghost that that same thing can happen to you and I. And that's where revival will take place in our communities we've got to get full of the Holy Ghost I don't care what you had in the past we've got to get full today I like to fish George Henderson Hoggard has been a great minister to me throughout the years because George Henderson Hoggard would always tell me he said pastor my ministry is taking the pastor fishing. Now, we all know that George Henderson Hoggard and Brenda Hoggard, they had a greater ministry than that of teaching kids for about 50 years. But I sure enjoyed that ministry that he had of taking the pastor fishing. Every pastor needs some sort of a minister like that. Now, I'm going to tell you, I, I went to one church and the pastor said, I don't like to fish. I said, do you like to hunt? He said, no, I don't like to hunt. I said, do you like to golf? He said, no, I don't like to golf. I said, what do you like to do? He said, I like to read books. I said, well, all you people here, you need to buy the pastor a bunch of books, and you just need to supply him with books so he can read. Every pastor needs somebody that will cater to that hobby, you know. But George Henderson would take me fishing, and I can tell you, you folks around here know what it's like in the heat of the summer. It's 95, 98 degrees, and you're out on the Chowan River, and there's not a breeze in the air. 
Old George has kind of rigged up his boat, and he's got umbrellas. I know some people buy these things, but he's got umbrellas stuck up there so we can get under the shade. But I'm telling you what, it's hot. No breeze, and I get thirsty. Can y'all get the picture? It's hard when it's 25 degrees outside to think about this, you know. But I want you to just think about it being in the heat of the summer, and it's hot. And I get really thirsty. So you know what I do? Thank goodness we both, we take a cooler, and we got, we got something in there to drink. So I look in there, and I, I'm so hot, and I'm thirsty. And I reach in there, and oh, I got me a bottle. So I unscrew the lid, and I look. It's available, but it's empty. Did that satisfy me? Not at all. Oh, but I look back in there, and I say, oh, well, there's got to be something else in there. And I look in there, and I find another one, and it's one that's available, and those of you in the back can't see That's a dirty water. It's not tea or Coke. That's dirty water. It's available. It's full, but it's dirty. Do I want to drink that? No, and neither do you. But then I look in there, and I find one that's available. It's clean. And so what do I do? I unscrew the lid. It's good when it just runs down your chin. (laughs) See, friends, we live in a culture, in a society of thirsty people. They're thirsty and they don't know what they're looking for. But you and I have what they're looking for. But we can't give it to them if we're not available, if we're not clean, and if we're not full. We can't give it to them. Most of you know, or some of you know my childhood. When I was young, my mother would either take me to the altar or send me to the altar every time the altar call was given. And she would tell me, she said, son, you need to seek the Holy Ghost. It didn't matter if dad or the evangelist or whoever it was was preaching on salvation. I had to go seek the Holy Ghost. If he preached on divine healing, I had to go seek the Holy Ghost. If he preached on demon possession, I had to go seek the Holy Ghost. My mother saw how important the baptism of the Holy Spirit was. I'm talking about Acts chapter 2, verse number 4. So I had to seek the Holy Ghost every service. I'll be honest, I got tired of it. But when I was 12 years old, we had youth camp at Camp Windsor. And I was excited, just like any kid, to go to youth camp there on Cooper Hill Road. But I had a little bit of a dilemma. The same week of youth camp was the Little League All-Star Games, and I was an All-Star. So what was I to do? All-star games, youth camp. So I got special permission from the camp director. don't even remember who the director was, but got special permission. I'm sure my dad had some pull. To leave camp at night and go down to the Little League ballpark. Y'all know where that is. And play the game. What is it, two miles apart? Play my ball game, go back to camp. Monday night came. I left, went and played my ball game, went back to camp. But on Monday night, all heaven broke loose at youth camp. Let me say, when you miss a night, that's usually the night that all heaven breaks loose. That's why it's good to be there every night. They had an awesome Awesome service. In fact, young people were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And there was one kid that was nine years old that got the Holy Ghost. And I'm thinking to myself, he's nine years old and he got the Holy Ghost. That's not fair, God. And I got really, really jealous because a nine-year-old got the Holy Ghost. And I've been seeking the Holy Ghost all of my life, 12 years. Well, five years or whatever. 
Tuesday night came. My dad came to pick me up, and I met him out at the car. I said, Dad, I'm not going to play ball tonight. I'm going to stay here and get the Holy Ghost. That night about 9 o'clock, they gave the altar call, and I went to that prayer room on the left-hand side facing the platform, and I began to pray for the Holy Ghost. And can I just share with you this morning that we always seek the giver, not the gift. You need to seek the Lord. And I began to just love on Jesus. And for about two hours, I was in there kneeling, and I ended up laying in that sawdust just praising Jesus. But I can remember this so vividly, my friends. They were singing the song, Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsty soul of mine. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. And as they began to sing that song, oh, it just, just stirred my heart. And all of a sudden, that precious gift of the Holy Ghost came upon me. And I began to speak in another language that I had never even heard of. And I want to share with you this morning, friends. I don't know who won the ball game. I don't know who they got to take my place. But what I got that night, I still have today. And it's been sustaining me and helping me. And that same gift is for every person that will hunger and thirst after righteousness. When we were 12, when my Shelly was 12 years old when we first went to Russia, my kids were 10, 7, and 4. But when she was 12, Shelly, my oldest, we came back. Y'all were in revival with, I believe, Teeny Fair. Powerful move of the Holy Spirit. Shelly had never been baptized in the Holy Spirit. But Shelly sought the Lord that night. And she was baptized in the Holy Spirit. She was on this side right here. The Lord baptized her. But she spoke in tongues for five hours. She laid right there. For five hours, I know, I stayed with her till 3 o'clock in the morning. Five hours. When she got up, she said, Dad, my jaw hurts. I said, I guess so. You've been talking five hours straight. This was a 12-year-old girl, and today God is using her on the mission field, St. Petersburg, Russia. I want to say you cannot belittle what God wants to do through you if you will just let him. He wants to fill you and refill you, but you've got to be hungry and thirst. I want you to stand with me right where you are. Would you do that this morning? Thank you for joining the Askewville Assembly of God Sermon Podcast. For more information on our ministry, please visit our website at askewilleassembly.com.